Please be seated, and please take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Revelation. A very exciting book. We're laying foundation at this point, looking at some, not only overview, but also some ways that we understand symbolism in this book. Revelation chapter 1, I'll read to you verses 1 through 8 if you'd like to follow along. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent it and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Three distinct things if you want to receive blessing from the book of Revelation. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Gracious Father, we pray for your blessing upon this, your word, as it goes forth, that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. And you have sent it to us, faithfully passed down generation after generation of believers, that they might know what the things are that are to come. Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall that as we began our study of the book of Revelation, we laid down some ground rules as we had first an introduction to prophecy to see how both the Old Testament and the New Testament give substantial amounts of space to the end times. And we saw that the Old Testament in particular contains a gigantic amount of end times prophecy as well as a gigantic amount of prophecy concerning the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to be flipping as we go through the book of Revelation back and forth to the Old Testament because many of the things that are mentioned in the book of Revelation are first introduced to us and given to us in extensive detail in the Old Testament. The second thing that we learned as we did our overview is that the New Testament not only restates and clarifies many Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, but it also gives new information not revealed in the Old Testament concerning Christ's return. That new revelation, which was not revealed in the Old Testament, is called a mystery, and we talked about the biblical mysteries in Ephesians chapter 3. In the New Testament, there are how many distinct mysteries? Somebody can remember for me. How many are there how many mysteries are there that are distinct mysteries listed in the New Testament? 17, very good. 17 distinct mysteries that are listed in the New Testament, things that were not revealed in the Old Testament to the Old Testament prophets, but now, says Paul in Ephesians 3, are now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. One of those mysteries is the rapture, which we'll be discussing in the course of this series. The third thing that we looked at 
is we need to understand the symbols used in the book of Revelation. We're going to start looking at some of those symbols tonight. We're going to get into one of the very big symbols in the book of Revelation, which we'll talk about in just a few moments, the Lord willing. In fact, it occurs so many times in the book of Revelation, you probably haven't realized how often it shows up. You just read along and just assume it, and you assume it, and you assume it. Uh, but we'll talk about that in just a few minutes, the Lord willing. Fourth, one of the basic hermeneutical principles of Bible exposition is to take the actual events literally, even though symbolic language is used to describe them, and we don't have to guess what the symbols mean because other passages explain those symbols, and we'll be looking at one of those very important symbols tonight. Fifth, you cannot understand New Testament prophecy without having a grasp of Old Testament prophecy on the same subject. So I hope that those of you who have been here at least once over the last three weeks have read those passages that I gave you to read out of the Old Testament because st things will start to click. In fact, if you read those every week as we're going through, you'll suddenly say, wow, that's a, that's a light bulb that just turned on. I understand that passage in Ezekiel, that passage in Jeremiah, that passage in Isaiah, that passage in Daniel. Those passages, they suddenly give you light that you had not seen before. So read them, not just once, but read them over and read them over and read them over again because as we go through Revelation, you'll suddenly begin to see, wow, God did give a lot of information to us already on this subject and Revelation merely condenses it for us and puts it in uh, an incredible order so we'll see the chronology especially of the tribulation period. But be sure to read those. Fifth, we have to have that good grip, grip of the Old Testament scripture. Sixth, it's important to understand that Israel and the church are not referring to the same group of people. It's a, it's a major mistake to equate Israel and the church. That jumbles prophecy so badly you have no idea what's going on. You know, that's a, a serious issue in Reformed circles uh, because even John Calvin refused to write a commentary on the book of Revelation. He's like, I don't, can't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And he was an outstanding expositor. And he wrote a commentary on every other book of the Bible except the book of Revelation because it's that one premise where, especially, but not only, in Reformed tradition, there are those who believe that Israel and the church are the same. It's called replacement theology. They say, well, the church has replaced Israel, and now we are the Israel of God, and they quote the book of Romans, where Paul talks about the Israel of God, but he's still talking about Israel. He's not talking about the church. And clearly from the context, you can tell that. But if you make that mistake, you will not understand what's going on in the book of Revelation. It'll all become allegory to you. It'll all become mythology to you. And it'll just mean something generally that there's going to be some bad stuff at the end, but we really don't know what it is. So let's just keep on driving along and hope the road doesn't drop off in a cliff. Israel and the church are distinct. And God still has specific promises for national Israel. We're going to see as we look at the book of Revelation and then as we look at the book of Daniel, Daniel talks about 69 weeks and one week. And he talks about how there are going to be 69 weeks to the cutting off of Messiah the Prince. And then after that, there's going to be one week. You say, what's that talking about? If you don't understand that prophecy in Daniel, you will not understand the majority of the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation deals with the 70th week of Daniel. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. But just please, don't confuse Israel and the church. God still has some punishment that Israel has to go through, which is related to the tribulation, which if you confuse Israel and the church, you have the church going through the tribulation instead of the church being raptured out of the tribulation. That is a big difference, folks. That is a huge difference. Are we going to go through the tribulation? Are we going to go partway through the tribulation? You know, there are a lot of folks who believe different things. Is the tribulation not going to happen at all? We're just going to sort of move into the millennium? Or are we in the millennium right now? If you allegorize Israel into the church, you come up with all sorts of weird ideas and they're all out there and they're floating around. But if you take it literally that God is fulfilling promises that he made in the Old Testament 
and during the tribulation he's fulfilling specific promises to Israel. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's called the time of Jacob's sorrow in the Old Testament. It's called the great tribulation in the New Testament. It's referring to the same period of time then suddenly things will begin to make sense. Because in the book of Revelation, it talks about something going on in heaven called the, the marriage and the wedding feast of the Lamb. So who's there if we're here? I mean, who's there if we're here? It won't make sense. This Israel and the church are different. They are distinct one from the other. Number seven, prophecies related to the return of Christ fall into two parts, the rapture, which was not revealed in the Old Testament, as I just explained, and the second coming, which is clearly revealed in the Old Testament. And we talked about the four different general, there are others, but the four different general positions of premillennialism, which means Christ comes back before the tribulation, excuse me, before the millennium, and that uh, has subdivisions of pre-tribulational rapture, mid-tribulational rapture, and post-tribulational rapture. All of those are premillennial positions. Then there is amillennialism, which says there is no millennial, no millennium, and we're living in the millennium right now. That is a really weird thought. If this is the millennium right now, well, I don't think heaven's going to be a very happy place, because this is certainly not a millennium as described in the Bible, where the lion lies down with the lamb and the child puts his hand on the adder's den. That's out of the book of Isaiah, get chapter 60 through 66. And it begins to describe millennial bliss. And this sure doesn't look like millennial bliss to me. There's post-millennialism, which says Christ comes back at the end of the millennium after things get better and better, and we're the ones who bring in the kingdom. Uh, this kingdom theology is very, very prevalent in the evangelical church today that we're going to be the ones who bring in the kingdom. That's not going to be so, folks. It's getting worse and worse, and Christ is the one who will bring in the kingdom. You can't have the kingdom without the king. And he has to be the one who crushes Satan. He has to be the one who crushes the enemy. He has to be the one who establishes his kingdom. And then there's preterism, which is very prevalent today also, where it says all prophecies concerning the second coming were fulfilled in 70 A.D., when Rome sacked Jerusalem, and that is a really painful, and we'll talk about it some more as we get into the book of Revelation, but a very painful and a lot of twisted scripture when you get into that, and especially when they twist up Matthew 24 and 25. Now, I showed you a chart, and we've already gone over that. We're not going to cover it again tonight. We overlaid that with a structural outline of the book of Revelation and saw that there is structure in all of Revelation, where as we went through it, we had A, B, C, B, C. So it's A, B, C, B, C in the way it's divided up. And in the second, or in that third set of C, which are the things to come, chapters 4 through 20, we saw there were seven sets. We saw set 1, things happening in heaven and then happening on earth. Set 2, in heaven, on earth. Set 3, in heaven, on earth. Set 4, in heaven, on earth. I mean, very, very organized structure as you go through the book of Revelation. And then uh, we covered the nine points at looking at Jesus Christ, the judge, last week. First, the revelation of Christ is of Christ, not of St. John the Divine. Christ is the subject and the object of the book of Revelation. He's the one who reveals himself in these chapters. Second, he is the one that is unveiled in all of his majesty and glory in this book. It's like an autobiography written about Jesus, written by Jesus. Second, we saw that the Son always acts in harmony with the Father. That's why we read in verse 1, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized the fact that he never did anything apart from the Father in John chapter 5, verse 19, John chapter 5, verse 30, John chapter 8, verse 28, and so on. The third thing we studied last week was the purpose of the book of Revelation is fivefold. And the first is to teach Christians. So what does God teach us? Well, he always teaches us sound doctrine. He gives us doctrinal instruction because we have to base our life on doctrine. You do not base your life on experience. You do not base your life on emotions. You do not base your life on philosophy. You do not base your life on worldly ideas that have been put together by some psychiatrist out there. The Christian must base his life on the Word of God, and so the first thing that God does is he gives us doctrinal instruction. If you understand the book of Revelation, 
It will change the way you live right now. These are things to come, but those are things that will motivate you to certain activity now. So doctrinal instruction comes from studying the book of Revelation. The second thing that God designed this book to do, its purpose, is to warn Christians. There are warnings to Christians, to churches especially. When we look at chapters 2 and chapter 3, the seven epistles of Jesus to the churches, there are some serious warnings. There were some very bad churches. We're going to see three things about the churches when we get there. There were not only bad churches then, but there are bad churches throughout church history that parallel precisely what is going on in the letters to the seven churches. And there are periods of church history. I'll give you more detail, but those are the three things we're going to look at. There are periods of church history that parallel each of the different churches that we see in the book of Revelation. I personally think we're in the Laodicean period right now, the church that is neither hot nor cold, but Jesus says, I will spew you, I'll spit you out, because you're neither hot nor cold. No zeal for Christ, no dedication, no commitment, a whole home kind of Christianity. We'll go to church if we feel like it. You know, we have no drive. We will not suffer anything. Now, you know, if it's a little inconvenient, we won't do it. Me, serve Jesus? Are you kidding? That's for the professionals, like the preacher. It's not what you see in the early church. We'll get to that when we get to Laodicea. The third purpose of the book of Revelation is to encourage Christians. We're going to talk about some of that encouragement tonight when we get a little farther. The fourth purpose is to prepare Christians for the imminent return of Christ. The imminent return of Christ. Not to prepare Christians for, well, Jesus will come sooner or later, but it'll probably be later. Uh, you know, we've got to have a bunch of signs first before Jesus comes. No, the book of Revelation makes it clear, as does the rest of the New Testament, that Jesus Christ could come back at any time. He could have come back at 200 A.D. He could have come back at 700 A.D. He could have come back immediately after the Protestant Reformation. As soon as Martin Luther nailed his theses to the door, he could have come back and blasted Rome. And we'll see Rome in Revelation 17 and 18. He, he could have come back at any point in church history. Believers are always supposed to be looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then number five, the book of Revelation is designed by God to motivate Christians to more faithful service when God has shown us the things that must shortly come to pass. The fourth, we saw the revelation was certified to a specific apostle, John the Beloved. It was delivered by angelic messengers to guarantee no slip-ups along the way. It has apostolic authority. It has ap angelic oversight. And, of course, it, a great deal of this book is going to be dealing with angels. You're going to see angels all over the book of Revelation doing all kinds of incredible things. And clearly communicating with people. When do angels communicate with people? Do you have any idea what brings about an angelic communication with a human being? The book of Revelation gives us some insight, and when we get to those communications, we're going to be seeing some other communications in other portions of Scripture. Other portions of Scripture pour into the book of Revelation. This is the capstone book of the Bible. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Revelation is the capstone that ties together all kinds of things that you see all the way through the Bible. That's why having good Bible knowledge, a grasp of other portions of Scripture, is so essential to the study of Revelation. And then, of course, we mentioned a moment ago, imminency. Imminency is one of the biggest keys to the book, things which must shortly come to pass. Semper paratus, always be prepared. Sixth, once again, we see in the opening verses that God chooses to use people to communicate his word. That has always amazed me. That God moved holy men in old times to write the word of God as they were moved by the spirit of God the word Peter uses for being moved by the spirit of God is, is a word that's used for a rushing torrent that you can't get out of it's an irresistible moving God was the one in control 
although he used their minds, although he used their training, although he used their language, although he used their vocabulary, he was the one who chose out of that vocabulary the specific words that are in our Bibles so that it is, in fact, the Word of God. Inspiration. If it is not true, you have no idea who God is or what he's going to do. In fact, you don't even have any idea of what he has already done because who knows whether those guys got it right or not. And you know that's one of the key doctrines under attack. The inspiration of the Word of God. Oh, but more than that, the preservation of the Word of God. Suppose God gave an inspired word and every, every jot, every tittle, every letter, every noun, every verb, every participle, every part of speech was exactly precise and he gave it to that first generation wow they had the word of God let me ask you a question if he didn't preserve it here we are 2,000 years down the road how do you know what you've got in your hands is the word of God but of course we're looking at God, aren't we? How big is your God? If your God can inspire the scripture, do you not think that he is big enough to preserve the scripture? That's what the book of Revelation is really ultimately telling us, is that all of those things that were prophesied in the Old Testament, now it's gathering them together and putting them in a little compact package a really powerful pill, if you will, the super pill of the book of Revelation, so that when you ingest that, and John's going to be told to, to eat a little book as we get a little farther along, he says, was in my, his mouth is sweet, his belly turned bitter. God is giving you a power pill here so that you will understand massive amounts of the rest of Scripture if you get it right. But it does you no good if it was only inspired for that first generation and was not preserved for generations to come. Those are important doctrines of Scripture, and you need to be aware of that. Then we saw that uh, not only did God choose people to communicate his word, but then we find that it was committed to an angel to give to John. The angel didn't give testimonies in local churches. He delivered it to John, and then John wrote it down and gave it to others. 7th verse 2 tells us that John had a threefold responsibility in writing the book of Revelation to record what he was told to record, except, for example, the seven thunders out of their voices and God said, don't write it. So he, he knows that he heard it, you and I won't. Number two, to record the verbal testimony of Jesus Christ as given in this book. And number three, to give account of the things that he actually saw. He's like on the witness stand under oath. Eighth, the series is designed to give you a blessing as you read and hear the book. That's what it says in verse 3. But the caveat is you have to obey the commands that are in the book. If you want the blessing, it's not merely a matter of hearing it or a matter of reading it. When you hear it and read it, you've got to obey it. And did you know there's a lot in the book of Revelation you have to obey? We'll see a lot of it in chapters 2 and 3. But all the way through the book, there are specific statements that you and I must learn to obey if we want the blessing of what's going on in God's revelation. The time is at hand. That's urgency. It's expectancy. Most of us have no urgency or expectancy in our lives related to the rapture. We know because I don't see it in your life. You have no urgency. You have no expectancy. It's business as usual. Fiddle around. Do nothing. Never even pass out a tract or calendar. How do I know? Because I still got several hundred of them left. And the stacks are not being depleted. And don't just take them tonight to say, well, you know, I'm going to throw them away and then he won't know. God knows. And then ninth, what we saw, the initial audience, the seven principal churches of Asia Minor. If you look at the map, they're spread out sort of a fan around the island of Patmos off the coast of Turkey. 
and each church had a different character, multi manifested multiple character qualities, and we'll look at each of those when we get to them. So tonight, the revelation of Jesus Christ introducing the judge, part two. That brings us down to verses four and following. John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And that's what we saw to close with last week. Then he says, Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And then it describes him some more, more information about the judge who is about to judge the world as we get into the book. The faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, who has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So we have seven statements concerning our Lord Jesus Christ that are given to us there, which give his qualifications as to why he can be the judge. So, let's begin looking at it. First, I think it's fascinating to note that after that introductory material that we just went over in verses 1 through 3, it's fascinating, at least to me, that a book about judgment begins with the words, grace be unto you and peace. You read Revelation and say, whoa, where's the grace? <laughs> Man, I don't find peace anywhere in this book. But that's how we open here. Grace be unto you and peace. Doesn't that sort of strike you as out of character with the book of Revelation? Sure did me. The first time I saw that, I thought, wow, I've read this book. I've read it, I don't know how many times, dozens of times. I've read through the book of Revelation. And suddenly that jumped out at me. Grace be unto you and peace. But you know what? That also gives us a very important key to who is going through the tribulations that happen in the book of Revelation. It's not the believers. Because we start to the believers, grace be unto you and peace. That's not what you see the people in the book of Revelation experiencing. The believers are not going through those things. The book is clearly written to believers, not to unbelievers. The believers have grace and peace. The unbelievers have judgment and wrath. The believers are recipients of grace, unmerited favor. The unbelievers have merited judgment. Unmerited favor, merited judgment. Unmerited favor, the unbelievers get justly deserved and fully merited judgment. The believers are fully encouraged by the words grace and peace to be encouraged. They will not experience the horrible events of Revelation's judgments. In fact, even going through the book of Revelation, we see periodic interludes in Revelation where the church is clearly absent from the judgments. We'll point those out as we go through. But, you know, people who think that the church is going through the tribulation, even those who think it's going halfway through the tribulation, they don't deal with those periodic interludes where the church is clearly absent. Second thing that we notice in these verses, God gives us the credentials of the divine author. In fact, we find all three members of the Trinity are mentioned. The credentials of the divine author that guarantees not only his authenticity and trustworthiness, but also his eternal ability because he was, is, and is to come. His eternal e ability to keep all of the promises of this book, both promises of wrath and promises of blessings, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. That's past, present, and future. Now, put on your thinking caps for just a second. Ask yourself the question, which member of the Trinity is that referring to? And a lot of people jump immediately to the conclusion and say, well, Jesus Christ, because those same words are used a little bit later to refer to Jesus Christ. In fact, I read them to you just a minute ago, but we won't go there just yet. Same words are used to refer to the Lord Jesus Christ, but in the context where they're used again, it's to show his equality with the Father. To show his equality that he is fully God 
just like God the Father is God. Now you're going to see this in just a second here. I personally believe, and I think, I hope you'll agree with me when we get through this whole discussion at this point, but this particular phrase in this particular context is a reference to God the Father. You know, last week we discussed how the Lord Jesus Christ does nothing apart from the will of the Father. He never does anything apart from the will of the Father. God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. So God the Father gives to the Lord Jesus Christ the things that are going to come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, which bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. So here we start, God the Father. The first statement of the eternal nature of God is a reference to the Father because it introduces the other two members of the Trinity in verses 3 and 4. It also helps us to understand the next phrase. Look at your Bibles. I hope you're following along. Then you'll see it yourself. Helps us to understand the phrase, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. We find that at the end of verse 3. Now last week, someone asked me, who are the seven spirits before the throne? That person is here tonight. No, no, wake up, wake up, wake up. He's here. Uh, oh, I gave it away. It was a guy. The seven spirits before the throne. In Scripture, and especially in the book of Revelation, as we'll be seeing in just a, hopefully two or three minutes, seven is the number of perfection. Seven is the number of perfection. These are not seven different spirits. But what we have here is a reference to the Holy Spirit who is always before the throne. We are told that specifically by the Apostle Paul. It is the Holy Spirit who is always before the throne. And you know what he is doing? He's making intercession for the saints. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us something very, very interesting. Now, we are Trinitarians. We are not modalists where we believe there's one God who manifests himself in three different modes. It's like there's this one God, and sometimes he puts on a glove that looks like the Father, and sometimes he puts on a glove where he's working around and he looks like the Son, and sometimes he puts on a glove where he's working around and he looks like the Holy Spirit. That's modalism. We are Trinitarians. We believe that there is one God, but that he exists in three distinct co-equal persons. That has been Christian, Orthodox Christian theology since the beginning of the church, since the New Testament. All kinds of other theories have come up, but that is Orthodox Christian theology. So we see here the one who is before the throne. Now, listen carefully, because both the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ make intercession for us before the throne of God. I'm going to give you four references. Two of those references refer to the intercessory ministry of the Holy Spirit, and two of those references refer to the intercessory ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look first at the ones that relate to the Holy Spirit. I hope you're taking notes, because a lot of this, we're going to talk, the book of Revelation, as we'll see in just a minute, talks about the seven spirits several more times in the book of Revelation. So you've got to get this right here in the first chapter, otherwise you won't understand the other references that occur in other chapters of the book of Revelation. So let's talk about the Holy Spirit first in Romans chapter 8. What does the Holy Spirit do before the throne of God? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And that is not speaking in tongues. The charismatics take that and say, oh, yeah, groanings, which cannot be uttered. That's a uh, gobbledygook, gobbledygook, you know. And they babble off on some weird nonsensical stuff. It says they cannot be uttered. Tongues can be uttered. This is not talking about tongues. 
This is talking about the work of the Holy Spirit before the throne of God. It's not talking about what the Holy Spirit does in charismatic Christians. Groanings which cannot be uttered. Now notice, and he that searcheth the hearts, verse 27, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. So we have another person of the Godhead involved here. He that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he, that is the Spirit, makes intercession for the saints, that's us, according to the will of God. Folks, I am so thankful that the Holy Spirit makes intercession for me because I don't know what I should pray for as I ought. Have you ever gotten to a, an impasse in your prayer life? where you're not exactly sure how to pray. You're not exactly sure what to pray. You don't even know what's good for you so that you could ask for it. That's what these verses are talking about it. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. He's God. He knows what you need. He knows what I need. He knows what's down the road, and I don't. He knows which direction I need to take. He's the one who has to bring things into my life. You know, he, he's interceding for me before the throne of the Heavenly Father to bring about certain events on earth in my life so that I will be directed specifically to do what God wants me to do. That's why you always have to be sensitive to the moving of the Spirit. Now the question is, what does the Spirit use to direct you? God has revealed his will in his word and as you test all the things that come down the road include testing the spirits but you also test the events of life you test the opportunities you test the options by the word of God and you'll discover that some of the options do not comply with the word of God and therefore they are not the will of God. All right, now let's look at the two passages that deal with the Lord Jesus Christ making intercession for us. One is in Romans chapter 8, and one of them is in Hebrews chapter 7. In Romans chapter 8, just a few verses after Paul has talked about the intercessory ministry of the Holy Spirit, he talks about the intercessory ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not the same as the Holy Spirit, just like the Holy Spirit is not the same as the Father. So if the Holy Spirit is praying before the throne... And if Jesus is praying before the throne, it's God the Father that's there. The intercession is being made for us. Jesus isn't praying to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't praying to Jesus. So we get it, Romans 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, now get the next phrase, who also maketh intercession for us. And just a few verses earlier is where he talked about the Holy Spirit making intercession for us. We get to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, and by the way, this particular tie-in is one of, I believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Other people believe many things. Some people don't say, we don't have any idea who did. This is one of the tie-ins that helps you see certain structural elements in the book of Hebrews that point to the Apostle Paul. But here's what we find in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So Christ is making intercession for us in Romans 8, 34. Hebrews chapter 7, which we've been talking about Christ all the way through, uh, beginning with he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek, uh, and then it goes on and talks about without father, without mother, without beginning of days, without end of life. Uh, made like unto the Son of God. And the word made like is not he's different from, but similar. It's the word that means in appearance. So Jesus as Melchizedek in the Old Testament took on an appearance that was the same as later people saw him here on earth. Abides a priest Continually, not like the priests of the Old Testament, contrasting with the Aaronic priesthood and with Levitical priesthood, but he abides a priest continually. And what was one of the jobs of the priest? 
to make intercession for the people. And that's why when we get down to verse 25, it says, he doesn't ever stop that intercession because he's not like those priests who die. He ever lives to make intercession for us. So now let's look at that number seven for a second. The number seven is prominent in scripture, especially in Revelation. Now, you can check me out on this. I mean, I think I counted everything right. <laughs> but there are 54 occurrences of the number seven in the book of Revelation. Now, when God says something once, he means it. When he says it twice, you better pay attention. If he says something 54 times in one book, and those 54 occurrences occur in 31 different verses. So 31 verses scattered through the book of Revelation, almost in every chapter. Some, cha some verses have two or three references to seven in them. That should tell us that God has importance attached to that number. And we'll see that as we go through. So let me give you a few of those. So see how it's written. Already we've seen one, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. From the seven spirits which are before the throne. Verse 11, chapter 1. Unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Verse 12. I saw seven golden candlesticks. Verse 13. The seven candlesticks. There was one standing like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Verse 16. He had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. You see, there's some things in here that you begin to recognize. Sharp two-edged sword. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Do you have any idea what maybe that symbolism of the two-edged sword is a reference to? The word of God. You begin to pick up some things and you say, wait a minute, there, there's someplace else in the Bible that defined what that was. So we have the sword of the Spirit, which is this two-edged sword. There are, again, we get down here to verse 16, seven stars. Verse 20, seven stars, seven golden candlesticks. And again, it says seven stars and seven churches and seven candlesticks and seven churches. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven references to seven in one verse. We get to chapter two, verse one. He that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Chapter three, verse one. These things have he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now who has the seven spirits of God? You'll discover when we get to chapter 3, it's the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's a reference to the fullness of the Spirit, which we're specifically told in the Gospels. Chapter 4, we get over to chapter 4. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So there we have it again, the seven spirits of God. What's the seven lamps of fire? You have to wait till we get to chapter 4. And I saw the right hand of him that sat on the throne, a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Which have chapter 5, verse 5. The elders said, Don't weep, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. Now who in the world is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who's the one who's the root of David? Well, I mean, most of us probably guess that one right away. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's prevailed to open the book to loose the seven seals. Seals have a very important function, and we'll talk about that later. So what are seven seals a reference to? In verse 6, we see there's in the midst of the throne. Remember, we've been talking about the throne. That goes all the way back to chapter 1. So we're still in heaven at the throne when we're looking at this. In the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, a standing killed lamb. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to a slaughterhouse. We used to have them in San Antonio, and I hated to drive through that section of town because it always smelled so horrible. 
The blood, as soon as they cut the throat of those animals, or more modern ones, that as the animal would walk through, this little hammer kind of thing would come down, hit them right in the forehead and blow a 22 bullet into their brain and they drop dead. As they drop, a hook they stick into their neck and drag them apart. Then they tie the legs up, hang them, slit the throat, drain the blood, and it would pour all over the place. I know it doesn't sound very beautiful. That's how a slaughterhouse works, folks. And then as it goes down the line, one guy cuts them right down the belly and dumps all the guts out. And as it goes farther, different things happen. The skin comes off, different chunks of the body come apart, and they're shipped off to different locations. But there's blood everywhere. Here's a lamb, and it says the lamb is standing, but it says as it had been slain. The next day, John 1, 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Another of the symbols is explained to us. These are easy symbols. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He was slain, but he was risen. That's why he's standing, although he is the Lamb as it had been slain. But notice what it says about him. Now, when Jesus appeared on earth, is this how he looked? Having, here we have the sevens again, having seven horns. How many of you have ever seen a picture of Jesus with seven horns? And seven eyes. How many of you have ever seen a picture of Jesus with seven eyes? I'll give you a little hint ahead of time. Horns in scripture, and we learn this from the book of Daniel. When we get to that passage, we'll be going over to Daniel. But let me just give you a little preview. Horns speak of power. Seven speaks of completeness or perfect, complete power. Or we would say in one English word, omnipotence. The standing lamb who has been slain has seven horns. We're going to find a bunch of horns in the book of Revelation. We find horns in the book of Daniel. They're explained to us in the book of Daniel. We see the application in the book of Revelation. But he has seven eyes. We find in the book of Zechariah, there are seven eyes. We find there's some omniscience, seeing and knowing everything. That's how the lamb is described. And then it says, now here we have it again. The seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. Who is omnipresent? In all the earth. Who is omnipresent? Of course it's God. Chapter 8. I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. So we first had seven angels in relation to seven seals. Now we have seven angels in relation to seven trumpets. Say, are they the same angels? No, we'll find that out later on, and I'll point the verse out. I can't believe our time is up. Uh, let me run through a few more of these just so you get the idea. Of the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Chapter 10, verse 3. And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. That's a passage that always fascinates me. I wonder what the seven thunders said. Verse 4, And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Chapter 11, The same hour there was a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And by the way, that was also described in the book of uh, Zechariah. Tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake there were slain of men seven thousand. Interesting. Not a general figure. Six thousand nine hundred and thirty-two. 7,000. God is making a point there, and in relation to the city of Jerusalem, it's a very precise number and a very precise count. Lost my place here, where we had the seven thunders. Ah, here we go, chapter 12. Um, there was another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. Horns, as we said, relates to power, but they're only seven heads. But they're ten horns. But 
we have the heads getting the crowns, not the horns. Then there are seven angels which have the seven last plagues, for in them is filled the wrath of God. That's chapter 15. Chapter 15, 6, and seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues. And then verse 7, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials. These are the bowl judgments, full of the wrath of God. Verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Chapter 16, I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Chapter 17, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me. So we know they are distinct angels, these angels that are doing things, because he says one of these ones, and it was one that dealt with the bowls, not one that dealt with the trumpets, not anything that dealt with the seals. It's one that dealt with the bowl judgments. Verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, we just saw seven heads and ten horns a little bit earlier here. The angel said unto me, verse 7, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast which carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. Verse 9, the seven heads are t seven mountains. Ah, so suddenly we're getting some internal interpretation of what the seven heads relate to, on which the woman sits. Oh boy. You, you know, we're going to see in chapter 17 and chapter 18, there are two different Babylons. Some people confuse the two chapters, but there are two different Babylons. One is a religious Babylon, and one is an economic Babylon. Ah, I wish I could tell you more. We'll have to wait for that. Verse 9, here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Verse 10, there are seven kings. Hmm, seven kings, seven heads, seven mountains, seven heads, seven horns. There are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. We find some stuff about that in the book of Daniel. And when he cometh, ah, he must continue a short space. Verse 11, the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven. Because there's going to be a beast that is killed and then supernaturally brought back to life. It is a counterfeit of the resurrection of Christ because he's the Antichrist. He is going to claim to be Christ. Chapter 21. There came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. That's all the way down in chapter 21. One of those last seven angels pouring out during the last week of the tribulation, the ultimate judgments of God. That's the angel that God uses to take John who has just seen all of the horrors on earth and gets to see the bride, the Lamb's wife, the church. That's why, as we began the message tonight, it is with such amazement that we look at the verse 4, Grace be unto you and peace because you're part of the bride. You're part of the Lamb's wife. You have grace. You have peace. The judgments that God will, because he is in the past, present, and future, and he is the Almighty, the one who is and was and is to come, the Almighty, who is judging the earth it's a guarantee that it will happen, but for you, the believer, grace be unto you and peace. I wish we could go on. Our time has passed. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that you have given to us grace and peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, through the Lamb that was slain and yet is standing. 
the one who is omnipotent, the seven horns, the one who is omniscient, the seven eyes, the one who is the judge introduced in the opening chapter, the one before whom every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Glorify your name in this book, which by your mercy we will read and hear and compare it with other scripture to know what you have promised, both in blessing and in judgment. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.